Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Taurus Report. I am here with my friend Lee Greer, once again, looking at things uh, that we've seen in the news lately that challenge uh, standard cosmology. And again, this week, we're going to delve into some large-scale structure, just basically big objects we're seeing in the universe where standard cosmology has a difficult time explaining how those could form uh, in 13 billion years, which is what standard cosmology says is the age of the universe. So um, I would like to share a screen here. Absolutely. And, and good evening, Joe. This is, it's a nice spring evening, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> Good evening, and uh, thank you, Lee, for joining us once again. Absolutely. And, uh, I am sharing here the uh, site that uh, you had mentioned to me, uh, which is a, a an article at physics.org uh, about the uh, another uh, large-scale structure that this same team has discovered. They discovered one. Uh, earlier. And uh, this one now that they've discovered is depicted here in this picture as, as a ring. And what had been discovered previously was that uh, that red arc. And so, Lee, I was hoping that you might uh, touch on uh, briefly for a lay person, if you can explain why, I mean, standard cosmology is saying the universe is 13.8 billion years. And if it is such, why should we not see uh, structures this large? Um, you, you know, as far as uh, trying to explain to a layman, like, uh, why is that? Why, why is something this large, a structure like this, why should we not see something like that uh, in the night sky? Right, right. Well, well, two of the maybe I'll I'll quickly screen share as well. Yes, I'm stopping my share. And uh, and uh, two of the major assumptions that uh, that are that are important in regular in cosmology and have been guiding lights in cos cosmology for a while. Uh, well, one they're summarized as the uh, cosmological principle, right? That that uh, at representatively large scales, the universe must have a distribution that is uh, essentially hom homogeneous, whichever you know, as you go out through through space, and also isotropic, uh, in that whichever direction you look, there is no pre pre preferred. Di direction and it's going to have the it's going to look similar it's going to look similar pretty much wherever it is and it's kind of an extension of the uh of the copernican principle that we're uh, that we're not looking at that we're not viewing from a special lo location but but from a fairly typical lo location within our universe and the friedman lemaitre robertson walker um cosmologies which are largely which are essentially the framework of the big bang cos cosmology basically holds that that in an expanding un universe you are going to to see this homogeneous and isotropic universe go going out and given the various uh, assumptions that are in the lambda cold dark matter version of that of that theory and the constraints in time by taking the the the, the reciprocal of the measured Hubble constant, uh, we only have about thirteen point eight billion years to to deal with, and using what are called n body simulations, uh, they they propose that that something uh, that the, the largest structure should be about one point two billion light years. Uh, across that would be expected to win for, to form within our universe. And so stuff that is larger than 1.2 billion light years because starts to become a, a, a problem for, for the simulations and for for the basic um, 
uh, assumptions with right, and, with, and so and I think it, it's part of the problem, if I understand it correctly, is that they're starting from assuming that the CMB is the afterglow of the Big Bang. Correct. They've yeah. got to kind of assume that. And uh, uh, I think I'd like to share a screen for a second. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, if I may interrupt you there. No, so we'll you're share, fine. We will share uh, back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, the thing that I wanted to just point out uh, in regards to what you're saying. Yes. Is that uh, if you look at, so here's a picture of the CMB and uh, for a layperson, what this is, is if you look in the night sky uh, in any direction, we get this sort of background radiation coming at us from all directions in space. And standard cosmology assumes that this is a snapshot, uh, basically, of the Big Bang. Yes. And so because it is more or less, I mean, obviously we don't, we see looking at it, that it's not like perfectly uniform, but no. it seems to be roughly speaking, you know, there's no particular special place. There is no, you know, big structure. I mean, there, there are some big spots of, uh, uh, colder areas and, and warmer areas and so on and so forth. But it all sort of looks kind of random going in all directions. And so if this is a snapshot of the early universe, and then if we look out in today's universe and we see something like this, basically the problem comes in where um, we have to have a model that can explain how we get from this, which is a very little structure, how do we get from this to this, where we have some big structure? Now, if, since we're um, uh, in the uh, standard cosmology, it is um, uh, based upon the Hubble constant where space itself is stretching over time then yeah. if we see some big structure now, then that means if we stare back in time, we should see that same exact structure somewhere uh, smaller. You know, sort of like if you imagine drawing a little tiny picture on the surface of a balloon and you blow that balloon up, then that picture that you drew would be uh, larger. Okay, and so depending on how large the size is, and if you know the expansion rate of that balloon, uh, then you can say um, how large uh, that structure was at the beginning, and you can uh, explain through your model how it developed over time. Now, the problem that they're having with these structures is that we're seeing structures that are so large they could not have expanded to that size uh, in 13 billion years. And so that's basically what the problem we're seeing because 13 billion years ago, everything, you know, in essence, there was no structure. Uh, that's the problem. Well, right. Uh, yes, that's right. The universe is young. Of course, they also have to herald in order to make these assumptions work they 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 have to herald dark matter and all of that to to help assemble the the large structures in filamentary ways and all of that so so hence there are the the use of these simulations which uh, where they take certain set set of differential equations that are that are part of the basic model and plug in these these values and then try to, to get something that approximates what we what we see. Right. Now. So you can play with uh, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, you can play with it, uh, play with those as parameters, play with those as variables in yes. order to try to get the structure that we're seeing now. Now, the difficulty, of course, uh, as we've expressed many times in this show ab about that is all of physics is based on pushes and pulls. Uh, yes. yes. That's <laughs> yes. what this exists. That's right. Yeah. Now, if you allow a theorist to put an undetectable 
dark matter anywhere he likes in his model, basically all you would be doing is you'd be putting in a pull wherever you need a pull and you can't explain it. And then if you're allowed to put dark energy in sufficient quantities wherever you see it, um, wherever you need it for your model to work, then you're allowing yourself to pull, put an invisible push wherever your, your model needs it. And yep. since all of physics is pushes, pushes and pulls, you know, basically you can make with the sufficiently right quantities of dark matter and dark energy, in my opinion, you can make any model work if, if you're allowed to do that. And notice that it's the same uh, with dark energy. I've had it expressed to me that, well, dark energy is put in as a constant. And in fact, with uh, the recent things we've been seeing with the Hubble tension, is the model doesn't work with it as a constant. And so now they're talking about a dynamic const, uh, constant, which uh, is sort of a contradiction in terms, I think, uh, to, to have a dynamic constant, you know, to change it to wherever you need, depending on the context. Uh, and all of that, in addition to inflation, which is a whole different um, phase of expansion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, with uh, dark energy, it is put in disks, or I'm sorry, dark matter. That is put in disks and filaments wherever needed, you know. And since it does not interact electromagnetically, one wonders, how did the dark matter explode or get distributed to where it needed to be to make these filaments and stuff? if it doesn't interact with anything. And I, I once talked to a standard, uh, a uh, supporter of GRLCDM about that. And uh, yes. his answer was, and, and maybe he was being a little flippant, but he just says, well, it was just there like that always. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so then the matter as it went out, it was just automatically sort of attracted into this filamentary structure because that's where the dark matter is, you know, and you ask, uh, how did dark matter get into a filamentary structure like that? It's right. like, well, it was just always like that. <laughs> so anyways, I, I've sort of uh, uh, yeah, yeah. a long digression, uh, Lee. Well, well, part of the problem is that is that we've got, we're approaching 20 years now with with structures that are getting bigger, well, more than that are getting that are on the border of or getting larger than our than our expected cutoff you know and that you know even the back published in 2005 the the great sloan wall of of galaxies you know which is about 1.38 billion light years across that you know that's that's a little bit beyond what what should be appearing there under current uh, assumptions but the model keeps being uh, adjusted to try to accommodate these larger and larger structures. What is interesting about this structure, just to return to this structure here, and it's the same team that, here, let me, sc I'll screen share just a Yes, second. it's your turn. Just a second here. So, so if, by the way, here is the great Sloan, Sloan wall there, you know, fairly large structure there for for sure okay and here it is in 3 3d now, uh, what's the largest structure that that can exist according to the current model and uh, how large is the sloan wall uh, the sloan wall is one 1 1.38 giga of light years or billion light years and the largest is supposed to be right around you know 1.2 Giga light years, although some people have put it back at about one light year, uh, one billion light years, you know. So um, there are some fairly large structures which which are out there as as we go out. Um, I have tried to within the website here take because these are also put in megaparsecs and convert them into into giga light years, right? So, for instance, here is the is the South Pole Wall, which is a very large structure, which may be part of a larger structure, which is 
500 to 550 megaparsecs, which is about 1.6 to well, about 1.8. Well, that's even bigger. Giga light years. Yes, and I just wanted to note sure, that, yeah. uh, for the Go audience on. that uh, Lee has put together all of this documentation and illustrations at his site, uh, Enlighten, uh, Enlightenment Legacy. And uh, I am going to provide links to this uh, in the comments, along with links to all of the sites to which we refer to uh, in today's episode. So okay. you will be able to see all this uh, documentation and work that Lee has done on this um, uh, updated. So Yes, and I've recently put put some new new stuff up there as well, you know. Um, so, yes, there's... Here are some of the structures just in our area. There's this big Lanakia structure, the, the, the Great Attractor, the South Pole Wall, a cold spot repeller, uh, you know, the Perseus, P Pisces, supercluster, so forth. You know, you've, you've got a bunch of structures out there. Here is the giant arc itself, which is about 3.3 giga light years or billion light years uh, across. And it's about 9.2 gigalight years distance so we so that is you know with the uh using the hubble relation and the standard candles going go, going out there and which which means that this giant arc stretches about one over one fifteenth of the observable part of the universe which is you know there's a very low probability of that being artifactual you, you know Right, um, and that, uh, yeah. um, if if I may, are are you uh, absolutely uh, yep. issue? Yeah, okay. So we'll we'll come back. Yeah, we'll sure. If back. you 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 want me to drop uh, sharing just just for yeah, a second. if you could just for yeah. a second because I yeah, want absolutely to point out absolutely. something in reference yeah. to what you said as far as a small probability of it being an artifact. Right. I'd like right. to share this article here, which uh, is done by. Uh, Ethan Siegel, uh, at, uh, and his blog is Starts with a Bang, and uh, he is, I would say, kind of a, probably the most popular uh, worldwide defender of uh, standard GR LCDM uh, cosmology, and this article I found interesting because in this article, Ethan uh, tries to make the point, and he's very careful how he phrases things. So he's not going to say that these structures just are artifacts, but he's saying that scientists should treat them as if they are artifacts until we do further research. And so I just wanted to, and I will include this link also. And so he goes uh, at great lengths basically saying, and I, and I guess I will just summarize his view with one anecdote he uses, sure. yeah. where uh, he says, like this, uh, uh, what is the structure exactly? Uh, it is a, a finding of a pattern in stars that are absorbing light uh, like magnesium-2, I think. Yes, that's correct. Mag magnesium two is one of the is part of the spectral signatures by which they detect the structure. Yes, right. And so Ethan, his analogy is, he's saying like, well, that's like if you were to search for in the United States, uh, as far as housing, uh, giant pink mansions, you know, on ten acres. Okay, and you search for those, and then you see some kind of pattern in the United States for these giant pink uh, uh, mansions like this. You see some kind of pattern in their distribution, and then it would be wrong to infer that housing in the U.S. follows this pattern. And so that's the analogy that he uses. So what he's mm. basically saying is that this... Uh, magnesium two signature that they're finding in this uh, uh, in this ring structure that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Where is mm -hmm. it? Oh, I have it on a different down way. further. Yes, yeah. 
Okay. Well, so there, there yeah, it is. the ring structure, he's saying those blue dots are basically the signature of magnesium two. But he's saying what really needs to be done is a full sky survey of all light, okay, or, or something. And he says that, you know, because we can't really do that yet, this may be an artifact and not really be indicative of a structure at all. And uh, I have several problems with that. Uh, and hmm. I, I am just wondering, uh, Lee, if you have a a response to that, or should I just go into it? Well, I would just quickly say that that stop sharing that, that with Ethan that I would love to have a survey of of all of those a full sky survey, and they re publicly release all of the all of the redshift data, all the spectra, uh, the infrared, near near infrared, visible. And they can throw in the radio and the and the, and the X-ray spectra too. I'd love to have all of that. And of course, I'm I'm sure many astronomers would, because then we'd learn much more about about the universe. Obviously, there is a limitation in, instrument-wise in all of that. For, yeah, and just crunching all the data. Yeah, cr crunching all the the data, but uh, certainly. Certainly, I think that they've made a pretty good case that that there is a structure there. I mean, they they come down to a point zero zero zero. That's three point zero 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 three percent probability of it simply being 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 an artifact. You know. Now, what is interesting? I'll just show this one thing, and then I would like you to critique uh, um, Siegel further there if you wish um is that uh and and, and this is uh Lo lopez at all 2022 it was published in the monthly notices of the of the royal astronomical society here's some of their figures and there's the there's the magnesium absorption and so forth and here's what it looks like on our sky between near the boetes booties the uh herdsman Okay, well, this this new structure, this ring is actually more of a corkscrew. So we're looking at more end on as as a corkscrew. Screw the interesting part about this, and it's about uh, one point three gigalight years across in diameter and a circumference of, of of about four gigalight years. But it's at the same distance. Suppose that it is connected in some way with a larger structure, and the and the authors raised this question in their paper by the, uh, following up on that because it is approximately the the same distance. So that's, uh, that's uh, interesting. I, I think it's even less likely that it's artifactual now. But hey, I I would say Ethan, make your best case for it being artifactual. You know, go go right ahead. You know, right, and uh, the. Let's see, where do I begin with that? So, <laughs> so I would say that uh, where, where a lot of this is going to me is um, uh, in this uh, leaving the realm of science for a minute and going to politics and, and economics, mm. the argument really to me is about funding. And I've been trying to make the case in my show that it seems to me a lot of computer time and a lot of observational time and just a lot of theorizing and effort in general is going into shoring up LCDM with uh, uh, exo basically exotic uh, suppositions. You know, when you're factoring in stuff like um, inflation and dark matter and dark energy, and then, you know, trying to change the Hubble constant in various ways. Um, when you're trying to, uh, to do all of that and make models that work function based on those assumptions, I have to believe that that is sucking away funding from where it needs to go, which 
in my view, would be resources should be dedicated towards modified gravity theory, uh, you know, to really encourage people uh, to say that, look, you know, this stuff isn't really working out because I think it's fairly obvious that it really isn't working. And there's aspects that I always emphasize of general relativity that work extremely well. Yes. Uh, and and the specifically ones that impress me with how well general relativity work, uh, number one is a uh, uh, relativistic increase of momentum when objects are traveling at high velocities, relative high velocities, uh, their effective mass increase, uh, saying their mass increases isn't strictly accurate, but their momentum increases as if they weighed more. Yes, correct. Yeah. So that's, that's why right. I'm saying it. Okay. Uh, and time dilation and uh, deflection of light around large masses. Now, all three of those things to me are where general relativity works very well uh, as far as uh, predictions and stuff and uh, places where it doesn't work so well or very minor, like let's say Umuamua, or in my opinion, comets or uh, the flyby anomaly, you know, those are pretty minor incidents. Uh, right. And so I can see where a theorist would be. Yeah. I don't, we, you know, we can't really, we don't have anything better. So we'll just go with this for now. Right. Uh, but the big question in cosmology to me is that, to me, funding should go where people are asking the very important question of why does GR explain these three things extremely well mm -hmm. and it does not work for cosmology? Okay. And, and that that's the million dollar question that needs to be asked. And the first step in going down that road is for everybody to admit GR doesn't work for cosmology to suppose things like inflation is absurd. Uh, yeah. That, that is not scientific. That's, that's mathematics. It's not science in my opinion. So uh, anyways, that that's where I feel my, and so this is like a long digression in answering Ethan, but um, he seems to want to just stay with uh uh we work with gr uh, in constructing our cosmology and that is the default mm. like anything else gets discounted mm. you know uh and that's what i think he's doing and, and i think instead that we should discount gr as far as cosmology goes based on the evidence we have right now and start considering looking at cosmology from the perspective of it being wrong and trying to get clues uh, that would explain how gravity really works, wherein mm. we can keep the successes of general relativity where, where it does extremely well. Yes, J just like we keep the successes of Newtonian as a heuristic way to, to solve all kinds of problems, including... Right. Travel, sending spacecraft different places and all of that, you know. That's right. That's right. And so uh, I mean, I guess yeah. I'm done preaching now. <laughs> well, I would just like to add on to that. As far as places for for funding to go, I would say, hey, have throw out all those. I mean, put all the cosmological models that because there are a number. There are some rivals now that are that are working that are challenging the the hot big bang cosmology in certain aspects and all of that just say look let's let's spend money on those places where we see an anomalies and um, and there is a certain amount of that happening uh but then let's throw it open and say look uh, you know maybe we're Maybe we need, you know, we've got better instrumentation now than ever before. Let's look at some of the anomalies that have been that have lingered there from years before, as well as well as some of the new anomalies that have come on since uh, 
since uh, July of 2022 when the James Webb Space Telescope became operational. You know, I think we have a, a lot that should be concentrated on and less concern and worry about, oh, let's shore up the prevailing paradigm. If the prevailing paradigm is right, it can it it can be defended <laughs> with incoming data, right? If it's mistaken, it, it can stand on its own two feet. Yes. It can stand on its own two feet. You know, if not, well, hey, maybe it needs to be tweaked or majorly changed in in some way. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yes, it's yeah. so. Um, and you know, speaking statistically again, uh, yes, just because. Uh, uh, and here I'm going to share a screen again myself. Sure, yeah. So uh, we look at, where is this link that I wanted to take a look at? We've seen stuff like this to sort of uh, repeat what we've seen. Mm, yes. It's yes. these uh, monster galaxies. And yep. uh, I, I, I'm not going to go into the whole thing again, but... This is what I mean about statistical. So uh, Ethan Siegel, he makes a statistical case for why we should treat those large structures as artifacts. Mm. Okay. But the interesting thing to me is when we see a monster galaxy, you know, a few hundred million years before the Big Bang, we see this monster galaxy. And um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Since, since since the Big Bang, you mean? It's right, the, yeah, right. Yeah. So we see this monster galaxy. And so instead of saying, okay, like the, the basic Big Bang is just proven, instead all the articles, they phrase it in the sense of uh, scientists are going to have to rethink how galaxies form in order that they could form so quickly. And so the underlying assumption there constantly is that we can't question the big bang right yes uh, i know i know you know we we can't question that uh, the only question here is how could they have formed and I, I am like very out of focus what's going on with my camera sorry about that everybody no no yeah oh, um, yeah i see what I, you're saying i yeah. just would like to say that the uh, lack of focus of the camera uh is not demonstrative of my focus on, on what I'm trying to say here. So. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so my, my point is uh, with Ethan, he seems to have, uh, uh, wants to go with what is statistically probable uh, in his view mm. in one case. But in this case, I mean, it strains credulity uh, and it strains probability to think that's, that a very much typical galaxy like we'd see now with the same metallicities and everything else, you know, is there it is like, you know, 400 yep. million years after the Big Bang. And you want to talk about statistically how the heck that thing can form. I mean, for a galaxy that size to make one rotation takes 300 million years. Right. Yep. Just to rotate one time. Right. Right. <laughs> and so there it is, like fully formed with the spiral arms and everything, like 400 million years after the Big Bang. It's well, anyway, so I, I have a yeah, problem. Yeah, it's true that, yeah, I've posted in another chapter on the website, I posted some some more stuff, a recent paper was that have come out dealing with galaxies that are that have seem to have quite mature stellar populations, might quite mature morphology. And less than a billion years after the Big Bang, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's it's like if we say that's improbable, you know, that does not seem to get us anywhere. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> see, I mean, it would be one thing if this was the, and, and if I might share it just briefly, then right. I'll, you know, here, if uh, you know, and of course. Of course, they actually, with this ring and so forth, with this large structure, the authors toy in their conversations, well, maybe an, another cosmology is necessary. And they referenced uh, the conformal cyclic cosmology of, of Sir Roger Penrose, you know, as a, as a, and, and his colleagues as a possible, you know, 
because his cosmology has been predicting that there's going to be large ring-like structures on the CMB, you know, con concentric areas of decreased variability and all of that. And there have been some structures observed, and and he and his group herald them as as evidence of of artifacts from a previous cycle of the universe in their mm -hmm. cosmology. I have not yet published the chapter where I review his and some other co comparable cosmologies. And, and but, I'm curious, with, yeah. their, with, with their cyclic, because uh, I haven't seen that work, yeah. uh, in their cyclic cosmology, um, are they saying that the something like the Hubble constant goes positive and negative, like there's a movement back and forth? Or no. How do how do they uh, like when they say cyclic cosmology? What do they mean? Yes. What what they mean is that is that if you because it's con conformal, they basically say you know and and he discussed it in his Nobel address to when he won the Nobel Prize for other for his for his black hole theorem. Um, you know, back in the, which he published back in the sixties in, in 2020, uh, he, he discussed this and, and in recent years, he has published some popular works and some papers, he and his colleagues on this subject with colleagues, in, as far as the papers, he with popular books and, uh, and uh, essentially what, what it is, is that, is that as our universe becomes more and more spread out, and black holes eventually evaporate through Hawking radiation and all of that, that that essentially you can do a conformal rescaling be, because a uh, photon, you know, being massless doesn't is also timeless, right? So you know, so so therefore you can do a rescaling and and start over with another, big bang so you have successive bangs after each other after which they become there's this conformal re rescaling and everything i have a chapter co com coming up which discusses all of that and which illustrates with with the papers and the graphics and all of that uh -huh. but that's essentially and one of the predictions is that you're going to to see uh evidences on the cmb at the surface of last scattering in standard cause cosmology from about 380,000 years after the big bang you're going to see see artifacts of of the hawking points of the final disappearance of supermassive black holes from from the previous eon leaving this sort of pattern this concentric this this ring like pattern of reduced or 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 dampened va variability in the CMB temperature, and they are arguing that 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 is a prediction of their cosmology, and they argue, of course, there's others of us that vociferously disagree that some of those have already been found. So that's... yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm going to have to take a look at that because I'm not really understanding. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's. Uh... Well, I'll have to. I'll have to take a look at it. And, and... Yes. Well. It's a beautiful concept mathematically, but it's a mathematical concept, the, the conformal rescaling thing. And, but, and of course, his skeptics will say, but there's no evidence that anything like that can happen in physics. And he says, you know, so anyway, they, they, they have that. Well, I mean, yeah, but they do inflation. Without <laughs> well, I, I understand. <laughs> so, so it's like, yeah, some of this, uh, you know, standard cosmologists, they can't really, uh, no, I know. Against uh, they can't argue against purely mathematical models because right that's right. what inflation is. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so so anyway, just just to go down to 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 some of the other stuff that emerges from this. Some of these structures, of course, like the gamma ray burst uh, burster structures, are there's a anisotropic distribution of gamma, gamma ray bursters on the sky. So that's a violation of isotropy there, uh -huh. for instance. Yeah, this and isotropy, again, to remind the viewers, isotropy means that no matter what direction you look, things should look pretty much the same. Whatever Correct. direction you look, yes. That's right. 
And this was a paper, you know, this is this is a paper before the JWST. This is Horvath et al. of 2014. And they're looking at, you know, and, and we're looking at some pretty deep, um, you know, 1.6 to, to 2.1 Z values or high, very high red red shifts. And, and these aggregations would suggest that there's huge structures out there, you know, 6.5 to 9.8 giga light years you know billion light years which is well quite far beyond the lambda cold dark matter size size limit you know right yeah you, you know and so that's just some of that you know here's a here's another one here this was this was a paper this this is balaz at all 2015 some another large you know 5.61 giga light years this huge this ring like structure of gamma ray bursters, you know, and it's way out there, you know, one, you know, 1720 megaparsecs, you know, so this is, this is a, this is a huge, you know, 5.6 gigalight years. That's a big structure. Right. You know? And someone... and it's a two times 10 to the minus six probability of just being a random fluctu fluctuation. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, <laughs> someone's going to say it's an artifact. Yes, right. And if you know it, you know it. And we've looked at this paper before. This the, some of these pencil surveys going out there seem to to show uh, sort of a wave structure of you know higher density, lower density. Okay. That, for uh, <laughs> my for my audience, I just want to explain when yeah. we say a pencil survey. Ah, uh, yes, about, pencil survey. Yes, we're talking about a narrow beam. Yes. That we're shooting out into the universe, and we are looking at how densely there are galaxies in that beam as we look about, about it. And we're yes. seeing like areas where galaxies are dense, areas where galaxies are sparse, areas yes. where they're dense, and we're finding that it varies kind of like a wave. Yep. And so I would just like to... Uh, uh, to uh, point out that yes. <laughs> cyclic uh, gravity and cosmology, uh, CGC, kind of predicts this sort of um, uh, wave-like uh, structure uh, in the form of sort of rings, you know, for uh, all mass. I mean, so what I mean by that is, I shouldn't say mass, all scales. So if you're talking about galaxies, if you're talking about solar systems, you're talking about um, uh, galaxy clusters, you're talking about the universe as a whole, you may see this sort of ring type uh, structure uh, in CGC. So I just wanted to mention that. Yes, yes, that's right. And of course, some of these, some of these periodicities, some of these structures, if these are not, real you know i mean if if these are real uh density differences that those they, these would be structures you know on the order of nearly nearly 10 giga light years across this that's a massive structure you know yeah now, now that i don't see how someone could look at that and say that could be an artifact um I mean, I don't know. Understand? Because I mean, we're, we're if we do a pencil survey, we're going to see what mass is in that pencil, right? Now, of course, one has to recognize, and we haven't gotten into to the issue, and we will at some time in the in the future of of uh, redshift anomalies. But this is saying, let's just say that the Hubble constant holds all the way. Uh, across we're gonna these look like bona fide structures out there big structures you know right so uh a paper that i just you know and then there's the whole issue about voids and all that stuff and how that affects the microwave background radiation whole other topic there of course um as far as the issues of violations possible violations of isotropy a review was recently published, um, which, which uh, basically, well, basically this review asks the big question, you know, 
are the the homogeneity and the isotropy assumptions behind the the standard cosmology of lambda cold dark matter even met you know is the cosmological principle that's been so foundational sound and so they go and review a lot of the data there they they of course view some of the big structures that we've discussed here that Siegel uh, talks about in his op-ed and and so forth and some of the issues that we just mentioned about anisotropies uh, you know like in gamma ray bursters and structures there and and it's very interesting that in 89 1989 when the first great wall was di dis discovered in the in a survey back then with with Geller and so forth uh, Vera Vera Rubin, you know the great great astronomer, said said this. It certainly has convinced me. That was the eighty nine discovery of the Great Wall. It certainly has convinced me that we're not living in a homogeneous isotropic universe. I mean, these things that I really suspected in in the back of my mind, I can now say publicly. I'm not sure the Robertson Walker universe exists. That's very interesting, and that's way back then, you know, that she said that. <laughs> and so, what would she say now? Well, so here is here's a little summary as far as issues of anisotropy in the universe. What we have here, you know, in galaxy clusters, dipoles, and the various cosmological per parameters. Of course, the kinematic dipole, you know, within the within the cosmic microwave radiation and so forth. This the CMB bulk flows nearby and all of that. Notice. That these and excuse me, excuse yeah. me. I just want to for our sure. viewers to sort of when we're talking about pole, uh, yes, pole, quadrupole, all, all of that kind of thing. Um, uh, think of a pole in, in this context as a direction, okay? And so, if you have a dipole, that means you have two different directions, yes. And so if things look different in those two directions, then you've got a dipole problem. Yes. Uh, and so, yes. so that's what all this talk about poles is. All this is is a list of things, a list of different things that we can look at. Yes. Uh, where we can look in this direction and see what they're like, and then we can look in another direction and see what they're like. Correct. So each of these things we can look at and compare the poles. Does it look That's the same? Correct. Or not? Does it That's look correct. the same? Or not? And so, uh, I just wanted to to say that for the audience here. And and the more incongruences you have between these different groups of poles, the more you you begin to wonder. Well, are the simple assumptions of the Friedman Love Matra Walker Robertson Walker model even met? We're maybe we're barking up the wrong tree, you know. Yeah. Now, so basically, yeah. Go ahead. The yes. Assumptions are not met. <laughs> Correct. Yes, the assumptions they try value. You know, it's a big paper, and it's well worth. You know, the readers, anybody who is interested, should go through it. I've I've got it linked on my website in in this chapter. You know, and uh, and all of that. But uh, hey, it's 102 pages. There's a lot of interesting information there. And they're struggling to to make it work within the within a standard cosmology of you know the Friedman Lemaitre of cos cosmology. Okay, well, um, I would just like to close with a couple of things, uh, sort of going off in a totally different direction. Uh, just some things I noticed in the news. Oh, and I better share a screen myself here. So let me do that. I was about to start sharing when I wasn't sharing. <laughs> and so the thing I want to take a look at, uh, because it just reminded me of something. Yes. And that is uh, this uh, paper I saw recently about the asteroid uh, uh, Dimorphos, where NASA hit it uh, with a missile called the DART, uh, impact. Yes. And uh, from observations uh, and modeling, uh, this group of researchers, and again, I'll put this link in the comments later, 
uh, yeah. this group of researchers uh, thinks that it may be a large rubble pile mm. where the impact might have caused a lot more deformation and there might not be a distinct like impact crater. And so I, I bring this up only because uh, viewers of the Taurus Report yes. are aware of uh, my uh, hypothesis I put forward, CGC, Cyclic Gravity and Cosmology, wherein uh, all masses, according to what I'm saying, uh, must exist in certain discrete sizes. Uh, because I believe that uh, gravity is cyclic in the sense that as you get away from the center of the object, whatever it is, gravity will vary in a wave-like way mm -hmm. um, as you get away from it. And so objects need to be of certain discrete sizes because otherwise when they get near the surface of that object, there might be repulsive gravity. And so any object that we encounter in the universe that is maybe still in the process of formation might behave like, uh, as it's described in this article, like a, a loose pile of rubble. Now, we actually saw uh, with Bennu, when the Osiris mission went there, we actually saw pebbles inexplicit, uh, inexplicably being expelled out into space from the surface of that uh, asteroid. And when they tried to land on it, the lander just like sunk right into it. Like it was a, uh, uh, as they described it, uh, like a, a ball pit, uh, yeah. you know, that the kids play in at, you know, like Chuck E. Cheese or something. And so it was very unexpected. And I think that, uh, well, in my opinion, that uh, we will encounter objects like this in the universe that are of um, the proper size where their surface isn't isn't stable uh, and may be only very lightly held together. Now, um, in that context, I wanted to propose an experiment uh, to do yeah. here on Earth to uh, test this idea. Um, I propose taking some uh, uh, weights on a very fine scale, I mean, as mm -hmm. fine as is feasible, mm -hmm. and starting with those weights uh, at the bottom of like the Marianas Trench, a deep trench in the ocean, and slowly coming up and weighing continu continuously the same object, like let's suppose, you know, we have uh, some 10 gram object, or I don't know what would be the ideal uh, weight where mm -hmm. the scale would be most accurate uh, manufacturers of the scale would know i would assume and so then gradually just bring it up to the surface and then from the surface can fit continue with like a weather balloon or something mm -hmm. bring it up as high as that will go and then yep. after that do a statistical study of the velocities of satellites Yes. Progressively um, uh, more distant orbits uh, because for an object that's not under propulsion and it is in uh, orbit, all you need is the velocity of the object uh, to know the strength of gravity. You don't actually even need to know the weight of the object. Uh, if it's in a stable orbit, all, all you need right. to know is the velocity. And so if they take the velocities of these satellites and go out and out and out and out, I think putting all of this data together, that the gravitational force will vary from a smooth curve in a wave-like way, that there will be mm. slight variations, mm -hmm. unexpected slight variations in a wave-like way. Uh, and so that is my prediction, and I'm actually hoping to write some kind of grant proposal to um, have this done, and uh, uh, hopefully we could work together on that, Leo. Yeah, 
Oh yeah, that that's that that sounds interesting. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I would I would like to be a part of that, Joe. And also that reminds me of some of the discussions that we've had before, which weren't broadcast, where we've said, well, uh, where you've su suggested to me that maybe some of the some of the structural phenomena that we see out there in the in in the universe may be reflective of some of some of more complex properties of a modified gravity as it were yeah. right that's right yes and so um uh yes yeah, so uh have you uh um anything else that you'd like to discuss tonight lee well there's have we have we covered uh, we have covered a lot of ground we've given people things to think about and to look up and all of that and uh and certainly there is there's more data i I'm trying to keep up myself. The data keeps coming out, you know, and uh, and papers also from former, you know, earlier papers. Some as I come across them, oh, oh yeah, this really belongs here in the story, you know. I'm trying to insert them in, you know. And, yes, uh, and uh, <laughs> as I said, I'm, I am going to include a link to your site so that our viewers can can go and really look in depth at uh, at the uh, real wealth of documentation of all this that is there. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, well, and thank you for also, Joe. I really appreciate our chances to uh, to talk together on these things. You know, maybe, maybe we'll do a program sometime in person since we don't live that far apart from each other, right? <laughs> hey, that sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks for joining us, and uh, we will see you again soon. Goodbye for now. Take care. Bye-bye.